Yeah, so we've just gone live. So thank you. Uh, let me just uh, welcome all of you who are there on our panel. And, uh, uh, you know, we have uh, uh, Patrick joining us in a couple of uh, uh, minutes. Uh, you know, as usual, there is some small uh, hitch in us joining us, but we have uh, uh, Eco, uh, Patrick and Michael, sorry, uh, uh, Richard and uh, Michael with us here on the panel. And I'll just do a quick introduction of all of them. And then I will also set the context uh, for the panel. So let me just start with uh, uh, Michael. Uh, Michael actually is the supervisory uh, uh, you know, board member of Givedon Switzerland, which is one of the largest uh, fragrances company in the world. He actually can be called a veteran of the fragrances industry. He is the chairman of the International Fragrances Association. He is also the member of the boards of uh, Manus Bio Inc. and uh, Scent Design uh, SA. Uh, he also has multiple investments uh, on his own and he's a French national stay, uh, living in Singapore. Uh, right next to a French restaurant, is that what he told me? And uh, I think you look for a, a place next to uh, where you can get uh, good uh, French cuisine. And uh, interestingly, uh, he actually is an IIT uh, alumni, which has strong links to India as well. So uh, no wonder that he loves both soccer and cricket. So that's a unique uh, combination. That's Michael for you. Then we have Eco, who's the president of Black Group Inc. based in Greater LA. And uh, she actually is doing something that's very important today, which is enabling smaller unknown global brands to crack the Chinese market uh, online. And uh, she was briefly the CEO of uh, USAME, uh, very widely known and acclaimed beauty e-commerce player. And uh, she actually did her master's in the US. Before that, she was working in uh, Beijing. And now I think she's in uh, LA. So that's uh, uh, eco for you uh, e-commerce expert. And then we have Richard who's the president and CEO and the director of Rejuve Indonesia, uh, which I think uh, he says is a brand that's actually, uh, you know, leveraging the opportunity that's posed by COVID. Before this, uh, uh, Richard was actually an, a typical IT guy. Uh, he played uh, the role of a CIO of a leading firm in Indonesia. And then uh, he had, uh, you know, a lot of stints at Infor, Computer Associates and Guinness, among others. And then I think he told me that he spends a lot of time in Singapore. And uh, of course, now he's in Jakarta. And you can see from his shirt that he's proudly wearing his local uh, branding and image on his sleeve, literally. Uh, and uh, I don't know when Patrick would join us, but I think let me just do an uh, introduction of uh, Patrick as well, just for the uh, you know uh, benefit of all, so that you know, I don't interrupt the panel flow uh, when he joins. Uh, he's the partner brand ambassador at Next 90 Days uh, based in London, which is a transformative uh, uh, consulting firm that uh, promises companies to, uh, you know, that they will see an acceleration or results or impact in just 90 days from signing them up. Before that, he was the regional sales head and a global marketing head for Santa Fe Relocation. And he was also vice president of sales, director of sales at multiple companies like the Plum Guide, Saco. Aka and uh, also at Korman Communities, where he spent almost 12 years as the head of sales. He is actually from uh, uh, Philadelphia. I'm just, yeah, Patrick, can you uh, 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 hear us? There we go. Finally, welcome. Thank yeah. you. Welcome. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so that's Thanks, Patrick for you. And uh, uh, pa for uh, Patrick, it's a big day, uh, interestingly, and all of us can congratulate him. He's actually formally launching next 90 days today uh, as we speak. So it's a big day for him. That's why you see him all properly dressed up like he's going for a party uh, or a ball or whatever. So that's all of us. So we are, uh, you know, very, very interesting panel from across the world, literally, and uh, with uh, different, uh, uh, you know, what I'm saying, backgrounds. So uh, I'm sure we'll bring a lot of uh, interesting perspectives to you. Uh, but let me just set the context of where we are coming in from. Uh, so in the last, uh, you know, few months as uh, COVID ravaged the world, the global trade and employment has actually shrunk by almost 30% according to some estimates. It's not a small number. Uh, so, uh, you know, 
one of the comparisons of 2020 has been with 1930 when the great depression happened or 2018 when the financial meltdown happened uh, but i'll talk about it a little later and then there are also very strong winds of nationalism that's blowing across the world in uh, multiple countries right now which also is putting a lot of pressure on uh, multilateralism as uh, you know we've known and which is actually the you know cornerstone of a uh, uh, global uh, uh, you know structure that we built over the past few decades and uh, there are a lot of people who are saying that uh, 2020 is unique by itself and it's not 1930 or 2008 because 2020 is actually driven by what governments have uh, responded to the pandemic and also the fear of unknown there is a, a fear psychosis that's sweeping across the world with the pandemic which is also generating its own reactions. And, uh, you know, uh, very important why brands are important in this and from a global versus international branding perspective is that 60% of all global trade today is intra-firm. And 50% of all uh, such things is between subsidiaries of a transnational firm. So it's not between governments. It's actually between companies. So companies are very, very important today from a global perspective. And interestingly, and uh, paradoxically, this is also the time that a lot of global coordination is happening. The vaccine effort, the R&D, the distribution of it is extremely global. You know, all countries are involved in it and we are all collaborating with it. So while we are all collaborating in one hand, we are also trying to, you know, close our borders and try and look inward and whatever. Uh, if you guys know that most countries have banned uh, medical exports, medical device exports, but they've made free imports of all medicines and all of that. So this is actually something that's common across the world. And I think brands are also, uh, you know, responding uh, as they would to this in their own manner. And a couple of the things that I liked was uh, uh, Nike's Play Inside Play for the World campaign. I, I really loved it as a campaign because it's very nuanced and uh, it also gives you a lot of, uh, you know, uh, wherewithal to play. And it also balances beautifully the local versus international. That's what I think. I would look forward to all your comments. Then there is Amazon, which is a closer home where I'm sitting. Uh, it's headquartered in. And what it did was it waived off all of its seller fees on its platform and has gone very aggressive on its positioning as your local store. So, you know, they've been speaking about it quite a bit and they're doing lots of things to connect themselves locally. And of course, we have uh, a brand called Cadbury, which is one of the biggest uh, you know, a uh, chocolate brand here, and I'm, I'm sure my, uh, many of you know this, they had a delightful commercial running this Diwali, where they actually started promoting local stores across India. And of course, there are, uh, you know, examples like uh, General Motors, Ford and Chrysler turning their uh, uh, factories for ventilators and Diageo offering its uh, factory for uh, sanitizers. So there has been, you know, multiple brands, the global brands who have responded uh, very strongly and immediately to this. So, you know, we have all of this. So this is the context that I wanted to set all of you. And what I'll do now is I'll ask each of the panelists to, you know, spend three to four minutes, uh, you know, putting their perspective on this. So we would start with Michael. Michael, would you be able to, uh, uh, you know, give your three to four minutes of uh, opening remarks? Michael? Michael? Are you Michael referring to me? No, no. I think no, 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 he's no, referring no. to there is, there is Michael a Okay. If Michael is not ready, can I come to Eco? Eco, can you just have your four minutes uh, uh, opening remarks, please? I'll, I'll just look for Michael in the meanwhile. Sure. Of course. Um, so, uh, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. Um, so, my name is Echo Zhao. Um, you know, as I've said, I've been working on U.S.-China cross-border e-commerce business for over 10 years. And, and currently, I'm working on an advanced O2O project, you know, online to offline projects, uh, which will benefit both the U.S. offline shopping mall and the cross-border product seller. So if anyone is interested in this topic, you know, um, just definitely, you know, contact me and we can exchange some thoughts. Um, so we all know 2020 is a such um, an unusual year. So COVID-19 has changed, you know, people's lifestyle, shopping habit, and uh, social form. 
So because of my background is e-commerce, so I will take uh, talk a little more on this field. So this pandemic, uh, basically we received the data. Okay, this pandemic uh, accelerated shift to US e-commerce by five years. So this number remind me of what happened in China in 2003 when we had another pandemic, SARS. So both of the top two China e-commerce platforms were launched on 2003 after SARS. So I believe that this pandemic may promote new retailing major players in the US and also, you know, after the COVID, digital operation will become, you know, ready demand. Okay, this is not option. So this is what you have to do for today's, you know, uh, retail business. And because of change of sales channels, this also impacts the marketing and the branding strategy for all brands. So, so, so the epidemic has caused the public to pay more attention to personal well-being. So the current period, I think it's for authentic, you know, well-designed contents based on like online video, web drama and the live streaming, which will increase, uh, you know, the short-term bonuses for all the brand, uh, branding activities. So this have been proved in China market because they, they basically they have a little more advanced, you know, e-commerce market over there. And, uh, and also, I believe this could be the most effective branding tools uh, for other markets as well. So, um, you know, as Xavier mentioned about, you know, like how this um, epidemic, you know, change people's thoughts, you know, of, uh, you know, globalization. So I think uh, that's true because, um, you know, many people are aware of this, uh, you know, the weaknesses and the risks uh, that globalization may bring. So at early days of this pandemic in the U.S., uh, many essential items were short. Sanitizer were sold out everywhere. So um, I know a brand, you know, they produce sanitizer, okay, along with other beauty products. So I reached them and say, hey, you know, this is a great business opportunity for you guys, you know, you should produce more, you know, uh, and also there's such like a high demand, you know, uh, from the people. But however, they just told me, um, you know, they couldn't, you know, produce more because they're, all their packaging, you know, bottles were made in China and they're short of inventory on packaging. And at that time, the manufacturing in China were closed and also, you know, the, the shipping between China and the U.S. is a really, uh, you know, a short, you know, of supply and very expensive. So this is just a small example show like, a, you know, how fragile we could be since everyone really, uh, uh, you know, a widely spread like an international supply chain. And uh, any change or one, you know, broken knot in this chain, can cause paralysis of the whole system. And most of the time, people have no control or power over it since the problem may happen, you know, in another side of the world. And of course, this is not only happening in the US, I, I believe many countries face the same problem. So maybe at the end, you know, people start to think, uh, you know, maybe we do need to bring some manufacturers back or make it available, you know. So that, that's what happened in the US, I believe. The rise of uh, nationalism through the pandemic um, is, you know, will also cause brands to face uh, public opinion risks, especially for cross-border marketing and the cooperation. It require a higher degree of cautions. Um, you know, for international brands, they're facing bigger challenges as how to deliver a positive universal message to all the markets which are so different and split. You know, today's message could be delivered, you know, around the world over the internet in one night. And every information on internet is trackable. 
So it's very important for brands to wisely choose, um, you know, their brand, um, you know, ambassadors regionally and internationally. So actually, um, you know, uh, I, I have a, a, you know, some interesting, you know, example to share you later, you know, regarding this topic. Uh, yeah. But I'll just stop here. To, yeah, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, in fact, I think I will come and pick it up on it later because there was a, a Chinese brand that, you know, did something in a quiz and got a boycott. So I, I'll talk about and ask you that later. Let me just get Richard in. Uh, Richard, uh, uh, can you just share your opening remarks? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Safia. Thank you, everyone. Uh, you see, I mean, I'm, I'm based in Jakarta now. So I... As you know, that this pandemic has actually changed a lot of things, right? how we live, how we consume, how do we shop, and so on. Uh, Bain has conducted the research, and even though the research actually is based on Southeast Asia, I believe it's applicable to all around the world, which is we know that uh, many people are now moving online, including essentials, groceries, and so on, right? And uh, then the company also moving online. They introduce new apps and so on. And because uh, economy is badly affected, value for money is also a key consideration for consumers at the moment. Uh, many people, the one, even those who are not used to, they are being forced to work from home. And the research says actually that that may stay. Even after vaccine is founded, implemented, and so on, I think uh, they say that up to a certain level, the work from home will stay. So it will never be 100% back to normal and uh, this also bring back awareness to many people about health about welfare because suddenly they realize that actually you know they are okay but suddenly they can be sick and vulnerable to high level of disease and may even death afterward and uh, during these situations we noticed that actually uh, those brands are uh, that are reliable that guarantee for quality safety are actually on the rise Right. Those are the new things that actually we are uh, being noticed according to the survey. And as we, if we compare between local and international brand, uh, I believe some of you already know, and some research has already proven that local brands are actually growing faster than international brand in many markets. Right? Uh, Unilever in China, for example, only... Uh, has uh, even after many years, they only have a certain percentage of ice cream market. The majority, the market leader actually is a local brand, which is actually uh, me and also many of you is never heard of. Okay, and this is also not only happening in China, but also in in many other countries. It's just depending on which kind of category. And uh, many many of local brands also have claimed top spots in half of the countries surveyed by the brand footprint. Okay, and while in developing countries like Indonesia, India, China, and so on, local brands usually represents more affordable options. They expect it to be less uh, cheaper. But in the uh, local brand in the developed countries are not really uh, that the case. They can command a premium a price premium as well. Okay. But having said that, uh, global brands actually in general, they have some advantages, which is actually they are more prestigious, usually. Uh, they are offering seal of quality. Okay. But local brand, the advantages that they, they are in general know the local better. They are more engaged. And because they usually a smaller company, they are more agile. They can react faster. They can innovate faster rather than many multinational, which is actually global brands. Sometimes they are they are they have too much bureaucracy and they need to meet certain level of uh, approval everything and so on a local brand also is perceived to be like reducing dependence on foreign countries right some nationalisms are on the rise uh, which is true okay but uh overall if we compare between the two which is the majority of this topic actually i like the term that is uh, being mentioned i forgot the the person name but they call it a uh, localization okay which is means actually it's a global act. Uh, sorry, global. You think global, you build a global product, global quality, but you act local. You think locally. Okay. And uh, this is actually is the reality today, which is also in the end, we, the company are being forced to consider people, their people uh, be in favor to the planet, 
which means actually environment is an issue as well. And But of course, as a company, we as the leader must also consider for the profit. If not, we cannot grow the company further. Okay. So I think in, in, in my view, actually, uh, for local brand, globalization, I mean, this globalization will allow them to grow and market share in their local economies, regional, as well as uh, maybe they are going global themselves. Okay. Uh, but globalization is not only for local brand. In fact, actually, global brand also doing it that way. If you notice, right, I think in Indonesia, McDonald's actually selling fried chicken. And that is one of their top uh, seller SKU, right? And in India, I think they are selling uh, the burger. Maybe it's not, it's not the beef, you know. Uh, that's, that's how localization affects them. In Indonesia, also, they are selling rice. You will never find McDonald's selling rice, right? But here, that is one of the hot selling points. That shows actually even global brand also think locally. So both actually in the end will, will meet in the middle, right? Because in the end, consumer, they want both global and local brand. Okay? Yeah. They will support brands that ensure, of course, high quality, safety. Okay. But they also want to be part of Hey, they know it is international brand. They want to be part of a uh, international community, right? But they also expect the brand to understand their culture, what's important to them, okay? Respect their culture. And if in a food and beverage, which is I'm in, understand their taste. Yeah. Okay. That's so I a- think that is the, 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 the thing that in my view, okay? And to summarize that, uh, in general, company that will survive and grow, uh, the brand must have a purpose, a mission. Okay, why do they exist? The brand must be reliable, show that they care. And I think the focus is that to build their brand uh, to be loved. So they must aim to build uh, the brand love. It's not only like people like it, but they really love it. I yeah. think that's that's what I can share for now. Uh, yeah, thanks, Richard. Uh, let me bring in you, uh, Patrick, because I think I still have Michael having probably internet issues. Uh, uh, you are, you know, promising transformation in uh, 90 days, Patrick. So tell me about it. Uh, and, uh, the, the, you know, how do you see this local versus international? Yeah, so I, I can talk from a different perspective. And, you know, as you mentioned, today is my launch for my new brand, which has been about three months in the making. So um, it is very early morning in Philadelphia. It's a pleasure to be here. My partner from Next 90 Days, uh, Neil Bothams, is also on this session um, and throughout the sessions today. But I think I I take it from a different perspective, Um, you know, as an American who has relocated to London. um, You know, I I took over a global marketing for a, a large mobility firm. And I think when I took that role, you know, you think that you can really take a global marketing approach. Um. With that being said, you actually need both, right? So we had just talked about globalization. It is global. Um, The brands that are winning right now are those that are taking advantage and opportunities, right? So, you know, one of my favorite quotes to my team and my partners is always, you know, we know it's not working. What can work, right? Um, You have to kind of take a different approach. And if you want to win, you know, you have to take a, di- a, a different look at things and how you how you market yourself within each country. Um, so so I think my spin is really, you know, while you can have a global approach and the international brands that are winning, they've already been mentioned. Right. Nike. Nike does an incredible job internationally. Why? Because not only do they you know, go to specific countries and they indicate those in their marketing, but they also show emotion. Right. If you look at those videos that they're promoting um, that are related to covid, they're incredible. I mean, the music and and every single detail about them. That's why it's so incredible. If you look at a company like Dunkin Donuts, they do a great job. Right. Because in every market, a Boston cream donut in the United States is very different from a seaweed donut in Asia. So they understand that and 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 how impactful that can be. Um, I also want to touch on collaboration. I think the brands that are winning right now are collaborating. You have to find ways to work with one another. Um, And one of the most impactful terms that I heard about 20 years ago was co-opetition. 
And it's a term that's not used all that often, but you know, when you're cooperating in the same space and you're competing, there are occasions where I'm going to compete with someone who does something very similar to me. Um, fortunately, with Next 90 Days and with my new firm, Represent, we really sit in our own space. Um, we have a really strong core competency uh, and we have competitive advantage. But what I'll say is when we do compete, right, when we're not competing, we work with one another. Why not? You have to right now to survive. So that's what I'll focus on a bit today. And um, yeah, absolute pleasure to be here. Yeah, thanks, uh, Patrick. I, I think uh, Michael is still not there. Michael, uh, Michael. Okay, so since Michael is not there, let me just uh, start with the questions. And I think uh, being the women on the panel, I'm going with you first, uh, Ego. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, so uh, the first question is actually a slightly uh, loaded one. Uh, uh, what's the likely impact of the change of guard in the U.S.? Uh, her microphone is still muted. You, you muted yourself. Iko, you oh, muted okay. yourself. Okay, yeah. I got it. Um, so I, I, I just say this is a, a kind of a big question. Um, so for me, I think if the U.S. has a new leader, many of the policies, uh, you know, policies definitely will change, okay? Uh, diplomatic, economic, you know, uh, because of, you know, uh, I think uh, today America is a very divided country. Okay, the two parties actually they represent two offset propositions. Um, but however, I just feel like uh, during the past four years, um, there is a growth of, um, you know, the nationalism. And there is also a new word like we call the uh, uh, Trumpism. Okay, so that means, you know, Trump is not only a president, you know, who can be on this position for maximum, you know, eight years. Uh, he already kind of established a new political ideology, which can last and impact the country for a longer time. Okay, so it's not about like if she's, he's there or not. It's like there's something like going to impact, you know, for a longer time. Uh, you know, that's what I feel and, uh, you know, saw today. Uh, you know, so yeah, yeah. Iko, anyway, I wanted to ask you. you know, going uh, yeah, yeah. So you know, there was a Chinese fashion, sorry, a global fashion brand. I think we did something very innocuous, right? They just had someone uh, using uh, eating pizza with chopsticks, and oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, the, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. So what happened is, you know, there was a huge boycott call. You know, their stores were, uh, uh, you know. Uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know. There was a lot of uh, impact out of it. There was an outcry, all of that. So, uh, you know, and I know that you mentioned about brands to take the risks and not play safe. So uh, can you just tell a little more about it? Uh, okay. So uh, I feel it's really a case-by-case -case situation. So when we talk about brand branding, you know, it's, uh, it's a result of long-term, you know, works and efforts. Okay, the purpose of the brand, you know, should be formed from the first date of the brand. So uh, I believe right now um, it's a good time for newer or smaller brands, local brands to stand out. Okay, to, to just clearly deliver their messages to the target customers. Okay, they are target customers. So I think this will be a you know game changer you know in in the battle of you know distinction because um, you know you need to find a way to stand out uh, and the brand who grab the opportunity you know they will survive and they can also thrive um, you know I, I'll give you a, a example okay maybe a little controversial but you know we can avoid you know the political topics you know today you know. Uh, among the business world, okay, it's kind of like always like, uh, you know, related. So uh, you all know, okay, a couple of months ago, you know, there's like, a, a, you know, um, a, a big like, a, a, you know, a BLM, you know, movement happened in the US. So at that time, okay, probably more than I would see 90% of the brands, major or medium, they follow the trend to promote this movement. 
Uh, and one of this uh, may appear, may appear of this uh, you know movement is the defunct police. And at that time, there's a one small brand, okay, a watch brand I never heard before, okay, eGuard. Uh, they posted a professionally made like a video uh, to support policemen on their YouTube channel. Okay, so this post, this video, bring the millions of traffic across and orders. Okay, they are like a. They, they're like, they receive so many orders, so they have to work out six months, okay, just to deliver the orders. So I give you this example. It's like they gain nationwide reputation overnight, and uh, they got their best business during the toughest time. Yeah. Okay, so so that's like a one, like a real example, like to tell you, okay, it could be beneficial. And on another hand, you know, you, you know, a couple of you mentioned Nike, but at the same time, this year, June, Nike just announced they lost the 38% of U.S. business just in one quarter. Okay. So True. because, yes. So, so that's what I say, you know, oh, I just feel like a, for like a bigger international, you know, brand, it's, um, it is it's just like a not that easy okay to take a, a, a you know a side okay because whatever you do half of the customer they will not be happy because today uh you know we're in a very divided world people have a different you know opinions yeah. about things okay. yeah you can so if, yeah. yeah thanks Joe. so uh, uh, richard i just wanted to ask you uh, 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 you know, how do uh, global brands uh, uh, address this? You know, uh, the, you know, the strong local brands obviously are, uh, you know, uh, having a better time now. So how do global brands look at and address this, you know, from your perspective? I, in my view, global brand basically, uh, like what I said previously, uh, they, are, they are also embarking on the same path. It's just that the difference is that which is going the localization, right? They are because they know that uh, they have the they have the backup of a very strong organizations. They have the backup with the strong capitals and so on. But they may be lacking in terms of speed, in terms of innovating, in terms of adjusting, and they may be lacking of, uh, for example, uh, local sentiment, right? Uh, I mean, I can give you an example. For example, uh, they're, they're also buying local brand that they are growing. That's one way of the global brand of fighting. For example, uh, Danone, right, which is the French uh, multinational company, they bought over Aqua many, many years ago in Indonesia. Aqua was the market leader of bottled water. Okay. And uh, recently, uh, Aqua got into trouble uh, because of the French president remark about those Muslim and so on, you see. And then so here there are a lot of demonstrations saying that hey, we should boycott the French product, including the Aqua, which is owned by Danone. But Aqua actually is uh, set up by Indonesians, by local brand. It just now is owned by, uh, by Danone. So I think... That's what the global will try to do, the global brand. They are trying to understand the local better. They are trying to win the sympathy. Okay. They are trying to show that actually they are part of the local economy. They are supporting local economy. Uh, they are not really like a hey, make you dependent of, uh, of the foreign countries and so on. So I think that's, that's how they, they do it in terms of expansions. If they cannot. Uh, promote their own brand the global will buy the local uh, leading brand okay I, I think that's what's happening all around the world which you can see in many other countries yeah richard that's, that's what I think. Uh, uh, richard you did speak about that uh, you know that reliability is very important for brands today remember the chat right. that we had so uh, you said what the consumers are seeking today in the pandemic post pandemic contest right are they you know putting reliability at a premium over anything else 
Uh, I believe that's also becoming very important nowadays, especially because when people got confused about how the pandemic spread, how the virus can survive, right? Especially in a food and beverage industry, you know, uh, like, like in my area where actually we should, we can, we need to ensure that actually the product are being built or manufactured are being made under very strict uh, quality control strict hygiene to prevent the virus from infecting you, right? Yeah. So uh, that way you can see very clearly that the, the many customers are actually avoiding product that is uh, having uh, in doubt in terms of quality. So that's why many companies, uh, you can see they are, they are showcasing how they are, they are enforcing the strict protocols in the manufacturing process as well as in the in the frontliner, how they entertain, how they serve customers, because the customer need assurance, right? Either product quality, either how you are being, uh, how are they being served by the company, and whether the company really respect that, uh, have implemented that health protocol strictly and so on. So I think that is, uh, that's what we are doing as well as a local brand. We really are highlighting all those quality that we have. The good thing is that that has been in our DNA since we started. So uh, it is it is natural to us uh, for us to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Pat. Uh, Patrick. I just want to ask you, since you do consulting, do you see this to be a passing phase, or do you think this is here to stay for very long? Whatever we are seeing today. Yeah, I, th I think there's specific things that really haven't changed, you know, with with consumers, for example, you know, they, they have the same expectations that they've always had, but even to a larger degree, right? Um, you know, in, in next 90 days, it's a little bit different than it, it is for represent, but represent, you know, we represent five star brands. So when you talk about the consumer that's within that five star, whether it be LVMH or you know uh, uh, the Shangri La or the Ritz Carlton or AKA where I sit today, um, you know there's an expectation with that clientele that really hasn't changed. Why has Amazon done so well? It's because they can deliver to your door that day, right? Um, it's really engaging with the, the, the consumer. And I think having that engagement is so important. Um, and I also think that, you know, you have to, you, you do have to take some risks. And I know that we'll get into that a little bit later, but, uh, the, the brands that are doing it really, really well understand that you, you can't lose the human touch. You need to have incredible response time and you, you need to, stick with your brand standards, right? If, if Richard just said that's in his DNA, right? You, you have to, as a brand, have a DNA. You have to have a brand book before you launch. You know, there's a lot of small things that go into building a successful brand. Um, and I think a lot of brands that don't get it right, they don't pay attention to those small details. So, yeah. And the next question that I had for you, Patrick, was that, uh, how do you uh, uh, you think the global brands can reinvent, tune themselves in today's context? Uh, you know, uh, Richard spoke about they are not in sync with uh, the local sentiment and many things else. So how do you think they can do better today? I think, uh, again, from what I started with, I think, and listen, if you, de if you deal with salespeople, you'll, you'll hear this all day long, right? It's COVID, you know, it, it, it's so tough. I can't get a client appointment. Um, Neil's on this session, you know, I came to Philadelphia and in, in three days I booked 15 meetings with clients. Why? Because I think outside of the box, right? It's COVID. Okay. If I can't see a client face to face, I'm going to engage with that client over a virtual coffee or a virtual lunch or have Uber Eats deliver fine dining to their home. You know, whatever that is. And I think I, I think that's really important right now for the brands that are going to win. You have to think outside of the box. I'll talk about five-star hospitality. Those brands, I mean, in order for hospitality and mobility, the two, two industries that I've really worked very, very closely with, in order for them to survive, they need to understand what it takes to operate, number one, and hospitality, right? Actually, in hospitality, if you look at the Rosewood in London, for example, 
they have actually increased their average daily rate. They have extended their length of stay. Why? Because they're brilliant, right? They have all of these collaborations. They have all of this outdoor space. And, you know, they collaborate with five-star whiskey and they do tastings. And you know what? A, a, a full-size suite is actually a great place for a home office, right? When you have a family and children and dogs all in your home and you're all within the same space, why not create, you know, a home office within a hotel or a suite? So I, I think it really has to be those companies that think outside of the box. And I come from a company culture that the answer is yes, what's the question? We want to win. We want to find the solution. Um, and I think those brands are going to continue to evolve and be successful. So what you're saying is capitalize on the opportunity. See it as an opportunity and capitalize on the opportunity. Yeah, so we have only three minutes, 30 seconds left. And, uh, you know, uh, I remember that uh, Mondelez International, which is another confectionery major, they came up with a new purpose uh, statement that called humaning. So they said uh, the whole thing that they want to focus on is about human connect in all their messaging and everything. And they want to talk less about value proposition and all those uh, you know, uh, you know, the typical brand talk that uh, brands do. So, uh, Richard and Eco, let me just come back to you with one question. Uh, uh, Eco, you said that uh, youth are more inclined to globalization and brands should tap into it. So can you just explain that a little bit more? Yeah. So you said, no, you again on mute, uh, Eco. Okay. Yeah. You last, last chat, you said that youth are more inclined to globalization. So, uh, you know, and then Brad should... Yeah, uh, I think that because the young generation, they grow up, you know, with the internet, you know, they get used to, of, you know, receiving, sharing information on this open platform, which gives them a better resource to think like internationally, you know, like globally, you know, especially for the past, like, I think, 10, 15 years, the majority yeah. mediums, you know, school, social networking, uh, mainstream media, they are all advocating, you know, globalization. So overall, I think of the young generation, they believe it's a good idea and how things should be. Okay, I think they're very open to international brands or overseas made products. And this won't change, you know, even for the pandemic or the phenomenon of re-recognizing, you know, a globalization. But however, I just think that, uh, you know, when we talk about branding towards young, uh, we need to categorize them better, you know, not only by age, but also, you know, factor of, you know, uh, education background, location, and, uh, you know, even they're independent or dependent, you know, this will be, uh, you know, very different, you know, factors to impact, you know, how they react, uh, you know, to, you know, international or local brand. Um, and also, you know, uh, there's also other factors, you know, uh, for brands to need to go globally, uh, you know, such as if they need like a local business knowledge, money, in number of resources, people, you know, may, this also they're like a main concern when you think about if they should go globally. You know, basically you're not capable to do it if you're not, if you're not fully ready. Yeah, thanks, Iko. Richard, I just wanted to ask you, you did bring about that Aqua and Danone. So how would you respond uh, uh, as Danone in the current context? You know, you can't stop the French from doing what they're doing, but, you know, you have a backlash in a particular market. So how would you uh, respond as Aqua and Danone in Indonesia market? Is there something that... Me as a consumer or me as Danone? No, as Danone. Uh, if you were a oh. bank brand, so what would you do? Uh, what, 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 what I would do, actually similar to what Danone has been doing so far here, which is basically they, they put all the facts that actually the product is manufactured here utilizing resources here from Indonesia, made by Indonesians, are for Indonesians. So uh, I think in terms of Danone, it's just a matter of uh, ownership, but it doesn't mean it's a French product. It is still Indonesians' product, loved by Indonesians, made by Indonesians, are for Indonesians. I think that's what they've been doing, communicating so far. So I think in general, communication is the key regardless of whatever we are doing, right? Uh, what Patrick mentions and whatever I mentioned before, one of the challenges is how to communicate effectively to our consumers. That's yeah, yeah. So we are up on time. So uh, uh, thanks, all of you. Uh, I just got a reminder that we are up on time. So uh, that's the problem with these 45-minute panels that you just warm <laughs> up and then it looks like you have to say bye to each other. It's been a real pleasure having you, Eco, all the frame from, uh, from LA and Richard in your colorful shirt from Jakarta. And I got to be there sometime and you're going to be my host. 
and uh, sure. uh, patrick all the best for your uh, uh, launch today 6:30 pm est and uh, have a, a you know highly great transformative journey with next 90 days and michael we missed you i know that uh, you had a, a a lot of internet issues and i i think uh, i'm really sorry i think we would have had great insights from you uh, but yeah loud speaking with you as well and we will have dinner when i'm in singapore in the french restaurant so thanks all of you and i'm just going to stop streaming and i think we will all stay in